Welcome to BG Insights by the Belfort Group, a video cast series where our industry experts share real world examples of how to combat disruption in your business. Good morning. Hi, everyone. This is Brittany. I'm here with the Belfort Group. I'm a director working on the BG strategy side of the business. I'm joined this morning by Don Martelli, our president and partner here at BG Strategies, and welcome. Thank you, Brittany. Glad to be here. Happy about the uh, time to speak to you about our topic of conversation today. So I'm looking forward to getting into it. Yeah, me too. Um, so I thought we'd talk about more of the redevelopment of the Northeast, what's happening right now. We've seen development grow across the country in some of the warmer states where people are fleeing, going to Texas, going to um, Florida, and you see big new buildings being built on vacant land. However, here in the Northeast, me in New Jersey and you in Massachusetts have seen, we already have everything pretty much developed. And land is more of an issue than down South. And what we're seeing is now that we need to pivot and reuse some of the land that's already built on. Something that I'm slightly reminded of like the change that's rapidly happened in my short 27 years is the mall situation that we have so many malls across the country that are just vacant parking lots at this point. Uh, I would say even 10, 15 years ago, I could go to my uh, local mall here and you'd have the night before Christmas, like everyone rushing to get gifts, parking lots packed and don't ever show up uh, after mm -hmm. Thanksgiving uh, during the holidays at a uh, mall because you're going to be circling around the parking lot for hours. Now this year, I don't know if it's just because of COVID, but I'm pretty sure it's the e-commerce situation happening with additional individuals now shopping, not at malls that we see the parking lots are vacant and the stores that used to be the big box name stores are slowly shutting their doors and changing their tune and now we're having vacant properties um, yeah kind of crazy how fast that happened absolutely i mean i think there's a couple things that are happening um especially in this region uh, that around you know repositioning of product um you know even now with existing commercial space office space in downtown boston you know there are people thinking through how to reposition that stuff as people are not going back to an office and it's very similar to what's going on with malls i mean as you pointed out there are a number of sort of you know malls that are here in, in new england that have been very busy leading the charge in terms of that consumer experience and over time to your point with the ability to order anything at any given time and have it at your doorstep within an hour through your mobile device. It's it's absolutely shattered the way people experience that retail, ex, uh, that retail shopping experience. Uh, so what you've seen, and I'd say even before the, before the pandemic, um, mall operators and owners rethinking about um, how to make those locations more of an experience. And it's really taking a bit of a playbook out of what some you know, mixed use developers have done when they've created, you know, um, you know, mixed use locations, like for example, you know, we've permitted Market Street in Linfield, which is, you know, used to be a golf course. Now is sort of an outdoor lifestyle center that has, you know, beautiful product, all types of restaurants and you know, an experience that consumers looking for, kind of a, a stroll, shop and eat kind of vibe with housing on the back side of it. And so as you think about malls, malls were just about shopping and that kind of quick food experience. Now they're rethinking, how do we take a playbook out of the mixed use market street type of experience and layer it into what we, we used to own, which was that consumer shopping experience. So uh, whether it be the Hanover Mall um, down in Hanover or the Burlington Mall in Burlington or others, uh, we have clients that have hired us to think you know, through that process specifically around how do we reposition uh, these properties so they become more of an attraction uh, for consumers and, and it, it might be the shopping that's the attraction, but oftentimes it's probably the, you know, the uh, the small uh, craft locations or the small wineries or the restaurants or you know new interesting exciting product that's sort of on the cusp of becoming kind of commercialized, but really cool and interesting to go to where you're not just going to the mall to shop for one particular thing and go home. You're going to grab a bite to eat and maybe, you know, you have a, a cup of coffee at a, at a, at a, um, at a little uh, coffee shop and then you're doing a little shopping in between then. So it's just creating new place 
with existing place. And our work at BG Strategies is helping our clients through the, I guess, the local political process to get the variances they need to do that. Because as you can imagine, you know, malls have a certain amount of square feet and it's zoned to do very specific things and operate in very specific ways. But if you're adding in restaurants, which means liquor licenses, if you're adding in more more food locations, which means you probably need you know, gas lines and electricity work and things of that nature to kind of scale these properties, all of that stuff needs local approvals and sometimes state approvals with liquor licenses. And as you can imagine, those are you know pretty tricky conversations because it's an impact on the community, city services, and you know our BG Strategies team does a masterful job at understanding what the process looks like, how that's going to be impacting the community, and how we, as their communications partner, help them through developing that story reaching out to the right people, the right influencers. So as the conversations start to happen between the mall operator and developer and the political decision makers in the community, that there's a very consistent, transparent conversation. And it, it turns into more of a collaboration with the community. So here's our vision. Here's what the community wants out of this. And then blending those two things together. So by the time the, the, the I guess the mall is relaunched, it's create this new experience for those that um, live around there. And, and as you probably know, I mean, folks v- will come from other communities to visit these locations. So now you're bringing in, you know, dollars from surrounding communities, not just to shop, but again, to spend, you know, $30 on four lattes at Starbucks and, you know, uh, $300 at, at lunchtime because you're there, you know, in between brunch. So it's just, it's, it's fun and exciting uh, for us because it, it really showcases our, public relations skills, our community engagement skills. And in that work, we're designing ads and creative elements from a design team, social media. So it really puts our BG services platform to you know use to get these things approved. So it's an exciting time and it's still continuing to sort of mature and I guess morph in different ways. So we're smack dab in the middle of it. And I can't wait to see what else you know comes down the pipe for, for our team to work on this sort of stuff. Yeah, it's definitely. An- interesting part of the business that we have and it's a very great opportunity to put your hands in the changing of future commerce or making sure that communities are heard when they do have a vision for their community mall i know people get a little uh, this is my backyard which is always interesting and fun or this is my mall this is our community it's not what it used to be and we don't want change And BG, I think, has done a really good job on making sure communities are heard during that process and being transparent in what we're building. A developer coming in and tearing down a mall to build a amusement park or throw, um, I'm going to use the top golf example that you said to me, might not work for the surrounding community if there's a school down the street or if there's something else in the community or neighbors that live by. And I think if the developer is interested, going door to door, talking to their community members is something that I know in the political sphere that I've done for years works and definitely making sure some of that organic grassroots efforts are completed during the process, I think is a great way to make some of these transitions smoother for the community and the developer. I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's really... It's 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 a partner. It's a true partnership and the dance between the developer and the community to make these things really happen. Because um, it's about closing that gap. You're the vision of the developer and the mall operator with the community, and you know, kind of melding these things together. Because the, the community has a there's a sense of place and fabric, and there's a you know, if you lived here, this is kind of what Burlington's all about, or Chelmsford's all about, or Hanover's all about. And you want to be able to you know add to that experience so people feel like the, the money they've invested in their homes is going to going to go up and the, the the investment they've made in their lifestyle will go up because you know, you're adding really good product and so you can't do any of that unless you have to your point really good open communications and, and are transparent about the process and are willing to hear ideas i mean a, a million times over, we've had experiences with clients where they've had an idea for a property and a project, and they were seeking very particular variances around zoning. Um, and by the time that project is done, it's better informed by the political decision makers, the neighbors, the residents, the the business, other businesses in the area. And so, by the time that project actually you know comes to fruition, is relaunched, you can see elements of those conversations. And that's the only way, unfortunately, that it sort of works here. And honestly, Massachusetts, it's 
these small towns operate like big businesses and it's and, and everybody I think is astute to the process and understands that there's things like mitigation and that hey, if you're asking for this, we're going to ask for, you know, improved playgrounds and our schools. So there's other ways for developers to support the community, but it starts with just, you know, very simple, you know, open dialogue and communication and being transparent about where you are and, and understanding that things will change as you get into the process. But um, in our experience, the only way you win approvals is when you do that very smooth communications process. And it's not just, you know, in people's living rooms and, you know, in person when you can safely or Zooms, but it's all of it. it it's, you know, getting stories in the local media about the conversation, you know, uh, talking to people on social media, text messaging, advertising, using all of these channels at our disposal to inform the neighborhood as well as the community and political decision makers what we're trying to do and then re report against that conversation so people feel informed because as you know, you tell one resident one thing and by the time it works itself down the street, the red pen is now a, a black magic marker. Right, so you want to control the information as much as you possibly can. And the only way you can do that is being very aggressive and proactive with your communications process, and that's what we do. Oh, the whisper down the lane campaign. It definitely can be a large impact on a project, and sometimes people are driven by two things: either you're in love and you want this to happen, or you're very fearful of what's happening. The people in the middle sometimes need a little push to get involved, but there's normally two camps of the project or whatever you're building. It's yep. very interesting trying to figure out how to change the hearts and minds of individuals. And I think you're right, the transparency starts um, the first step. Yeah. But something I want to bring up that you said is the D word, zoning in Massachusetts. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it is, I would say, a playground in itself. Yeah, it is. It's um, it's a very complicated process. Um, and every town has a, you know, their own zoning bylaws, which are governed by the planning board or other related um, entities and things like conservation commission uh, committees that are not, not you know, f uh, a planning board per se, but they can inform how a planning board decides to yes or no a project. So we, we are, you know, astute at understanding what the zoning bylaws are in every community we work in. Um, and obviously there's real estate attorneys that, you know, obviously this is their business, but it's our job to understand the nuances and um, you know, whether it's a, a car dealership or a mall or a residential build out or a commercial build out or a mixed use to uh, build out, usually we have to go in front of these boards because what we're what the developer is looking to do somehow in some way will change the fabric of that particular property based on how it can be operated. So you have to go in front of your town open town meeting, representative town meeting, the mayor, city council, regardless of the fabric of that particular community and seek those approvals in. No, it's 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 a legal process, but it has a very heavy dose of communications and PR, and which is why we do what we do. And I always joke and I equate it to trying to get an individual elected to office, right? There's a person who believes in very particular things, who wants to represent their community around these particular issues and driving that through the process. And zoning bylaws are pretty much the same. There are, you know, uh, you know for example, some zoning bylaws say that you cannot operate a, um, uh, for example, a cannabis um, operating facility, whether it be a cultivation facility or a, um, a dispensary within certain feet of a school or a church or within a neighborhood. Um, some communities have that those zoning bylaws a little lax. Some zoning bylaws say you can't have a certain amount of car dealerships on a very particular stretch of road because it then becomes creates an auto mile versus others don't mind the auto mile. So every community uh, there's a general lane for zoning bylaws, but then there's all these little, you know, cutoffs and, and spill-offs that make it pretty daunting. And it's, I don't think we've ran it across, you know, communities where everything has been even or or, or equates to another community we worked in. It, there's always some nuance and some difference. And, and then you layer in the project and how you're trying to change those nuances. And what what the towns typically worry about is if you do this in Sterling, Massachusetts, and another developer shows up 10 years down the road, can they take advantage of how these zoning bylaws were changed? So sometimes the decision is not just about the project and what you're asking for in terms of those zoning bylaw changes, but the long lasting impact of those changes on future development. 
And so a lot of the work that we do is look to see, okay, has a project like this been done before? You know, the zoning bylaws already changed in some way, shape, or form that we can take advantage of, and which is why the attorneys step in. But, you know, sometimes it's not just about this particular decision in a long-term impact on a community for zoning bylaws, which is why some of the towns will have zoning bylaw committee uh, committees that specifically focus just on the bylaws to manage that very maddening, complicated, complex process. Very complex, and you're right, no town is the same. So good for us. In New England. That, yes. Well, I know down here uh, in Jersey, we have the same hurdles. I think lots of the northeastern states are facing this redevelopment crisis, and lawmakers across these states are quickly trying to figure out ways to uh, adapt. And during that process, whether you're in Massachusetts and Lynn, or you're in um, Cherry Hill, New Jersey, the type of communication strategies, I think stay the same. It's being transparent, yep. sometimes over communicating, making sure that the facts are out there and making sure that you do have open dialogue with the community and listen. You really do just as much as they need to listen to the project and understand the project, you need to listen to the community and make sure at the end of the day, your development or the new changes to your mall fit the community because yep. you're their neighbor, just like they're your neighbor. It's, yep. We're all in this community together. Agreed. I mean, I, malls are the topic of this conversation, but whether it be malls, cannabis locations, residential build outs, big apartments, small scale stuff, commercial development, mixed use, schools, you know, high schools are a big topic of conversation because there's a lot of dilapidated schools in the Commonwealth that need to be um, you know, redeveloped in some way, shape or form and finding space for that. It, regardless of the, the end product, the process of the foundation beneath that, to your point, is you know, good community engagement that is transparent and, and overly communicative, um, available and responsive, um, and a, a boatload of boatload boatload of listening because mm -hmm. if you're not taking in the feedback from the board you're in front of the community you're talking to the abutters the business owners the people you will impact of this project um, you'll never get it passed um i think people there's so much information about projects out there these days that you know people can rally very quickly to you know create petitions and you know create the nimbyism and, and start to get ahead of your narrative which you know, kind of puts the our clients at a bit of a disadvantage but um, having a good, solid communications PR plan around your development and making connections in the community and, and building those relationships uh, is important because you know, we always preach that we want our clients to you know, be good neighbors, right? Yeah, they may be operated out of Florida or Texas or California, but there should be, you don't have to be physically in a community to be a good neighbor. If you're listening, understanding the fabric of that community and providing um, you know, some some framework or, or at least working through mitigation to make sure that you can do your project at the same time and impact the community positively. It's just going to help the, the client down the road to get things approved and kind of be that good neighbor. And when it comes to malls, these are very large scale operations. You know, they have, you know, some commercial um, office space included, maybe some hotels and there's there's living, you know, there's apartments or condos mixed around. Now, what could be these lifestyle centers that have maybe a dog park and they have coffee shops and they have, you know, um, different um, pockets for parking. So it doesn't look like a vast parking lot. That's like this cold wasteland. It looks like a mini city within the city. And to pull that off and to do that, you have to take an idea, you know, add a little uh, fertilizer and some water to it and grow it. But you can only get to that point when you have those very honest, open dialogues and conversations with the community and those that will impact. So it's, uh, it's exciting work for us and it's, um, and we'd love to be able to see, our impact and I look at all the developments we've done over the years since I've been here. I, I either visit or drive by a lot of these locations. I'm like, oh geez, I remember when that was a golf course and there was a hole over here, but now it's a, a veterans preference housing. So our impact in the greater Boston, New England area on development is millions and millions and millions of square feet. And it's not going to end because to your point earlier, malls are being redeveloped, office space is being repositioned. And, and I think you know BG strategy is well positioned to help our developer clients you know, get those approvals they need. I agree. Well, it was lovely talking to you, and I'm excited to visit these new change malls that we have our footprint on. And thank you for your time. You too. Appreciate it.